Guys, so today we are going to continue with our uh, radiology book club uh, on the fundamentals of diagnostic radiology, the fourth edition. Today we are going to talk about chapter three, the craniofacial trauma with your colleague, Dr. Alexian. Uh, and now we can start. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first, we will uh, start with this in the slide, the imaging strategy. Regarding the skull films, actually skull films will never demonstrate significant findings in low risk. And in those with high risk, it's poor to, record, to characterize or execute intracranial injury. The CT, as you know, is the best imaging for what we are familiar with. That's availability and it's fast. We use the narrow window, medium window, and very wide window. Uh, regarding scalp injury, when interpreted in CT scan for head trauma, start with examination for any extracranial structure for evidence of scalp injury or radioactive foreign bodies. Regarding scalp fracture, the non displaced read lineal fractures of the calvarium are the most common, but isolated linear fractures usually don't require treatment. Surgical management is usually indicated for depressed or compound skull fractures. <laughs> And here in this bony window, we saw the scalp fracture very clear, the bony fracture, while in the narrow narrow window, we cannot detect it well. Regarding temporal bone fractures, opacification of the mastoid air cells fluid in the middle air, pneumocephalus, these are may raise the suspicions of temporal bone fracture. Fracture of temporal bone is classified in two ways. The first one, what's called all rich classification according to the orientation of the long axis of the fracture to the petrous bone, either longitudinal or transverse. Mix type also occur. This is called the Ulrich classification. Another way, another way of classification is according to the involvement of the OT capsule, either OT capsule uh, violating or sparing. The violating fractures are usually more severe. Here we see this is the fracture line. It's longitudinal to the long axis of the pyramid of the petrous bone. This is called the longitudinal fracture type. And it's usually it accounts for 70 to 90 percentage of the temporal bone fracture at result from blow to the side of the head and associated with complications <laughs> like conductive hearing loss, CSF, otorhinorrhea, fracture or dislocation of the ossicle. Facial nerve may develop as usually delayed or incomplete. This is the less severe. <laughs> Well, here the, the transverse type, the axis of the fracture is perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the petrous bone. This is the less common, but more severe and associated with more complication and facial nerve palsy can be seen up to 50% which is often complete. And also this type of the fracture may involve the carotid canal or jugular foramen. <laughs> The head injury classification classified either to primary lesions that are the result of the primary insult or blow to the head or secondary lesions that can occur as a consequence of the primary insult. Now we start with the epidural hematoma, which is one of the extra axial injuries, usually arterial in origin. It result and result from skull fracture in 85 to 95 percentage of cases that disrupt the middle meningeal artery. 
They can also occur without associated fracture, especially in children. And most of the epidural hematomas are temporal and temporoparietal in location. We said that most of them are arterial in origin, but venous epidural hematomas can also occur, usually as a result of the dis disrupted dural venous sinuses. Usually they occur at the vertex. The epidural hematoma usually will not cross cranial sutures. So the, in the vertex, yes, in the venous. This is a, a, C, a non, non contrast CT image show acute epidural hematoma, which will define high attenuation, lenticular or biconvex extraaxial collection. Associated mass effect with sulcus infacement and midline shift is frequently seen. The next type is subdural hematoma. These are typically venous in origin may result from disruption of the penetrating branch of the superficial cerebral artery also. We, so we said it's usually it's venous in origin, uh, result from stretching or tearing of the cortical veins as they are crossing the subdural space. Typically, they extend over much larger area than do epidural hematoma. And unlike the subdural epidural hematoma, these can cross the sutural margin frequency, layering the entire hemisphere convexity. But they don't cross the falx cerebri and tintorium, while the epidural may cross it. Diffuse swelling of the underlying hemisphere is common, and there may be more mass effect than what would be expected from the size of the collection. And the reason why this don't cross and this not cross, it's as shown here, as the outer, the periosteal layer of the uh, epidura is firmly attached to the inner skull table at the suture sites, while the, in the subdural space is less tightly attached. So the Epidural hematoma may cross the suture, don't cross the sutural line, but can cross the false, while the subdural hematoma, they can cross the suture and may lie, lie the entire hemisphere, but don't cross the false cerebri. This is an uncontrolled CT image show acute subdural hematoma appear as a crescent-shaped extraaxial collection of high attenuation. By the time most acute subdural hematoma are imaged, the collection is hypertense, measuring 50 to 60 hands of unit relative to the normal brain, which measure 18 to 30. So this is in case of the acute subdural hematoma. It shows hypertense collection. The other side, we have the epidural. This is another example of the subdural hematoma. Which cannot <laughs> We said that in the acute phase, it will be hypertense. In the subacute phase, or transition from acute to chronic, 
to maybe come isodense to the brain tissue, but we have indirect signs on CT. This includes effacement of the sarcoid. Uh, here, this is the collection, but let's look a little bit isodense to the brain tissue. So our indirect signs include effacement of the sulci, effacement or distortion of the white matter, what's called white matter buckling, abnormal separation of the gray-white matter junction from the inner table of the skull, called thick gray matter mantle, and distortion of the ventricle and midline shift. Here there's heterogeneity, including active bleeding into a, a clotted blood with the heterogeneity, with mass effect and and displacement of shift of the midline. On this, uh, the picture, this is and good. This is chronic subdural hematoma as the collection is hypodense. Another type, this is what's called hematocrit effect. This is occur in either re bleeding or in patient with a clotting disorder. It, it shows fluid level between an old and new blood. MRI also, same picture. Uh, this is a picture of the MRI. And what we in MRI, acute subdural hematoma appear iso intense to brain on T1 and hypo intense on T2. In the subacute phase, T1 will demonstrate high signal intensity caused by presence of methemoglobin in the subdural collection. This is a big advantage of the MRI in the subacute phase where it's difficult on the CT to detect it. Hyperintense on T1 and the shape of it, it will take a biconvex shape on the coronal plane rather than the crescent shape, which we which we see in CT. Yes. In the coronal plane. The third one, injury is the subarachnoid hemorrhage. The subarachnoid hemorrhage is common in head injury, but it's rarely rash enough to cause significant mass effect. In those who found unconscious after unwitnessed event, detection of subarachnoid hemorrhage may indicate rupture and neurism rather than trauma as the primary cause. Because, as we said, it's rarely rash enough to cause significant mass effect. On CT, subarachnoid hemorrhage appear as linear area of high attenuation within cystern and sulci. Hyperacute subarachnoid hemorrhage may be more difficult to detect on conventional MR than its own CT because it can be iso intense to brain parenchyma to T1 and T2. Subacute subarachnoid hemorrhage may be better appreciated on MR because of its high signal intensity at time when the blood product is iso intense to CSF or CT. So, and the hyperacute subarachnoid hemorrhage may be more difficult on the MR than CT. On the subacute phase, it may be better appreciated on the MR than CT. Chronic hemorrhage on MR may show hemostrain straining in the subarachnoid space which appear as area of marked decrease in test signal intensity on both T1 and T2 weighted sequences. So these are two images of the CT, short subarachnoid space that's high attenuation linear area within the sulci. This is another one in the sulci and the salivian fissure. Another uh, entity of the extra axialing versus intraventricular hemorrhage. They can may result from rotationally induced tearing of the subependymal veins on the surface of the ventricle or direct extension of the parenchymal hematoma into the ventricular system 
or intraventricular blood can result from retrograde flow of subarachnoid hemorrhage. This CT image shows a lot of the uh, types of the insults and the collections, but we concerned with here, this is the ventricular hemorrhage. The intraventricular hemorrhage appear as hyperdense material layering dependently within the ventricular system. Vale. The other, other side also. Any collections of an increased density layer in the occipital horn may be the only clue to intraventricular hemorrhage. He has you know, cortical contusions, he has subarachnoid hemorrhage in addition to this intraventricular hemorrhage. Now we completed the extra axial uh, injuries, which, which are the epidural, subdural, subarachnoid, and intraventricular. Now to the intraaxial, start with diffuse axonal injury. It's one of the most common types of primary neural injury in those with severe head trauma. Direct impact is not necessary to cause this type of injury. Now it means the direct impact on the site at where the injury may develop. And it's much better appreciated by MRI than CT. These lesions have not been seen as consequence of simple falls and loss of consciousness typically start immediately after the injury. <laughs> These are important to note. Diffuse external injury is seen in characteristic locations and the site or the location correlate with the severity of the trauma. Those with mild form of diffuse axonal injury have lesions confined to the frontal and temporal white matter near the gray white matter junction. Those with more severe trauma have lesions involving lobar white matter as well as corpus callosum. Corpus callosum involved in 20%. In the most severe cases, diffuse axonal injury involved the dorsolateral aspect of the midbrain and upper pons. And this is the CT appearance of the diffuse axonal injury. Actually, it may be subtle or absent. We may not uh, see any finding. Therefore, the MRI is better for evaluation of diffuse axonal injury. Here, And here we saw that uh, there's a small petechial hemorrhage, petechial hemorrhage at gray white matter junction of cerebral hemisphere or corpus callosum. This is the usual picture. This is another one. This is a petechial hemorrhage involving the sepinium of the corpus callosum. This is MRI picture, proton density, and uh, T2 images show sure, this is a high signal intensity in the typical uh, para uh, location in the frontal lobe. This is the typical location of the diffuse axonal injury. So MRI findings, MRI findings, we, it could be, so the, is the diffuse axonal injury maybe hemorrhagic or non-hemorrhagic? The non-hemorrhagic usually shows small foci of increased signal intensity on T2 within the white matter and may be multiple. 
the D1 show decreased signal intensity. So this is high signal intensity. So this is non-hemorrhagic type of diffuse axonal injury. The hemorrhagic type is show central hypointensity, the opposite, central hypointensity in T2 and hyperintensity on T1 image. This is the MRI appearance of diffuse axonal injury. This patient has prior history of severe, severe trauma and demonstrate multiple hypoechoic foci in distribution that's characteristic of diffuse axonal injury. Hypointensity they include the gray white matter junction here and also the cerebral pedicles and also the corpus callosum. And this is the diffusional, uh, diffusion weighted image and ATC map of diffuse axonal injury. In the diffuse, uh, diffusion weighted image, we saw this is the lesion is large, while on the ADC map, it's smaller, much smaller. And that's because of the surrounding edema around this injury. Now, the other one, uh, in, in the intraaxial insults, it's cortical contribution, usually associated with better prognosis than diffuse axonal injury, and much less likely to have loss of consciousness. And it's occurred near bony protuberance of the skull and skull base, multiple and bilateral, and more commonly hemorrhagic than diffuse axonal injury. Less than 10 percentage of the lesions involve the cerebellum. And as we said, it's usually occur near bony tuberance over the temporal bone above the petrous bone or posterior to the gridus venous or at the frontal lobes above the cripriform plate or planum sphenoidale and lesser wing. Cortical contusion. Also at the margins of the depressed skull fracture it may occur. This was the picture we see before now. Non-hemorrhagic lesions are initially poorly seen but become more obvious during the first week because of associated edema. Hemorrhagic lesions are seen as foci of high attenuation within the superficial gray matter. So these are foci of cortical contusion. They may be surrounded by large area flow attenuation secondary to surrounding edema. During the first week, the characteristic CT pattern of mixed areas of hypodensity and hyperdensity salt and paper patterns become more apparent. I don't understand this appearance. Salt and paper appearance. Oh. Here, where? On MR imaging, contusions appear are poorly marginated areas of an increased signal on proton density and T2 weight sequences. Characteristic distribution in the frontal and temporal lobes and often have a gyral morphology aid us for the diagnosis. Hemostrain staining from hemorrhage of any cause lead to markedly decreased signal intensity on T2, especially at higher field strength, which can persist indefinitely. The another type of the injury is intracerebral hematoma. Intracerebral hematomas tend to have less surrounding edema than cortical contusion because they represent bleeding into areas of relatively normal brain. Most intracerebral hematomas are located in front of temporal white matter, although they have been described in the basal ganglia also. 
the these are image of intracerebral hematoma. Uh, this is in the temporal bone uh, loop. This is also in the temporal loop. This is your hyper density surrounded by edema. Cortical confusion. This is another type, also another picture of large amount of intracerebral hematoma. Multiple. The next injury is subcortical gray matter injury. This is uncommon manifestation of primary intraxial injury and is seen as multiple petechial hemorrhage primary affecting the basal ganglia and thalamus. They typically seen after severe trauma. The another intra, uh, intraxial injury is vascular injuries, arterial dissection, occlusion, pseudoaneurysm formation, and acquired IV fistula may occur. Arterial injury commonly accompanies fracture at the base of the skull. The internal carotid artery is the most affected artery and typically occur at the sites of fixation. These are MRI findings of vascular injury. And here, this right internal carotid artery, this is high signal intensity seen here, indicate presence of intramural hematoma inside the vessel. Also, in this left vertebral artery there is high signal intensity which also include hema uh, intramural hematoma and flu yes that's the flap here's the flap <laughs> the another type of vascular injury, the fistula formation. A carotid and cavernous fistula may occur between the cavernous portion of internal carotid artery and the surrounding venous plexus, result in venous engorgement of the cavernous sinus and the draining tributaries, like the ipsilateral superior ophthalmic vein and inferior petra sinus. When MR, the a carotid cavernous fistula may manifest as enlarged superior ophthalmic vein, cavernous sinus, and, pet and petrous sinus flu voids. Because of this, the arterial blood going to the uh, venous system with a high flow, which make it a flu void. Now, we finished the primary head injuries. Now, uh, we discussed the secondary head injuries that result as a consequence of the primary insult. The first one is diffuse cerebral swelling. It may occur either because of an increased cerebral blood volume called hyperemia or an increase in the tissue fluid contents called edema, cerebral edema. Both leads lead to generalized mass effect with effacement of sulci, supracellular, quadriginal, cister, and compression of ventricular system. <laughs> The face of a brain stem cyster indicates severe mass effect. Hyperemia is recognized on CT as ill defined mass effect and effacement of the sulci and normal attenuation of the brain. 
Edema causes decreased attenuation on CT image with loss of a gray white matter differentiation, as we see in this picture. There is low attenuation of the brain tissue. Normal, yes. While in edema, it causes decreased attenuation or CT image with loss of the gray white matter differentiation. The cerebellum and the brain stem are usually spared and may appear hyperdense relative to the low attenuation brain tissue, as in this, in this picture. Another entity of the secondary brain injuries is the brain herniation. This number one, this is the subfalcine herniation. Number two, the acal herniation. Number three, the transtentorial herniation. Number four, the external herniation. Number five, is tonsillar herniation. The subfalcine herniation is surely the most common and result in herniation of the cingulate gyrus uh, below the fox cerebellum to the opposite side and usually both the anterior anterior communicating artery are displaced to one side anterior cerebral artery are displaced to one side and they are trapped against the fox cerebri and may lead to ischemia as the tributaries of this artery The another one, this is the ankle herniation. It results in herniation of the medial portion of the temporal bone against the tentorium. It's causing a focal mass effect on the ambient sphere. Ambient sphere. And it may. And it may lead, this is herniation, may lead to. And the contralateral cerebral peduncle may be stretched and, and may develop hemorrhage within it, what's known as Kirnohan node. Was, actually, I didn't find a picture or something else for it. The another type of herniation is the transtentorial. This is the descending type. May also uh, ascending or may occur in cases when there are hematoma in the posterior fossa it may lead to upward this is downward ascending this is the type 4 this is the external herniation and this is the type 5 is the tonsillar herniation and the, another secondary head injury is hydrocephalus can result after subarachnoid or intraventricular hemorrhage as a result of the Impaired CSF absorption at the level of the arachnoid granulation or uh, obstruction at level of the aqueduct of the fourth ventricular outflow foramina. Mass effect from cerebral swelling or adjust hematoma can also cause hydrocephalus. Asymmetrical lateral ventricular dilatation can be produced by compression of foramen of one drop. The another entity of secondary head injury is the ischemia or infarction. The global ischemia or infection may cause by hypoxia or reduce the blood flow. Oh, this is known, but the pattern of infection from focal mass effect. The, in the subvalcane herniation, usually the ischemia occurs in the tributaries of anterior cerebral artery. In ankle herniation in the posterior cerebral artery, tributaries infarction occur. Tonsillar herniation, the ischemia or infarction occur in the tributaries of posterior inferior communicating artery. Cerebellar, yes. I think in the book it's written like this. Okay, so make cerebral. This is the another secondary head injury, CSF leak. It usually requires a dural, uh, dural rupture or 
appear in order that the CSF can leak. Contrast, you can see contrast passing here indicating actively. There is a mention that radio nucleotides cystinography is uh, very good for detection. It. Another type of the secondary heat injury is the leptomeningeal cyst. And this is uh, occur when there is a, a site, uh, there is a tear in the dura, and there is the subarachnoid, the arachnoid, subarachnoid space is extending through a suture of the fracture line. And due to CSF pulsation, this suture or fracture expand over time until it become like this, this lytic lesion appear on the Just skull x-ray yes. the another uh, secondary head injury this is encephalomalacia which are areas of low attenuation and of volume loss that occur as a result of previous injury it's the site is corresponding to the previous site of injury with these areas of low attenuation and volume loss. Regarding brain stem injury, as either primary or secondary, most of the primary or diffuse axonal injury affect the dorsolateral aspect of the middle brain and upper pons. They are difficult to diagnose in CT, nearly always seen in association with lesions of the frontal or temporal white matter and corpus callosum. Primary brain stem injury may also occur in form of multiple petechial hemorrhage in periaqueductal regions of the rostral brain stem. While secondary brain stem injury includes infarction, hemorrhage, or compression of the brain stem. Dorate hemorrhage is a midline hematoma in the tegmentum of the rostral pons and the brain seen in association with descending transtentorial herniation. This, it can be recognized by its uh, unique position yeah, the, from the side of it. As we said, the most uh, primary primary injuries occur in the dorsal lateral aspect of the midbrain upper points, while this one occurs in the midline. Another is uh, the facial traumas. This is lateral bone fracture with engagement of the lateral rectus muscle. <laughs> the 
that's thank you. In addition, I would like to thank your colleague. It's uh, a hard work. I want to talk within a short amount of time. So 